Okay, welcome aboard. We are currently live on Facebook now and recording. We'll start in probably a minute. There's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, and besides, if, if people get left behind, I think they can just patch up on the rest of the topic. Actually, I was as I was sharing earlier over Facebook, I'm a little worried about this webinar, actually, uh, only because the topic that we are going to tackle is, is not a resolved topic at all. You know, there's a lot of open ends in this particular uh, topic. And at the same time, uh, there's a lot of conflicting uh, opinions. So it's going to be quite ambitious for us to be able to cover it all in a little under an hour, but we'll try our best. Okay, I guess I, I think we can start. So welcome everyone. This is webinar number three, but episode two, because we started with episode zero uh, of AI for Lunch. And we're going to be back on our regularly scheduled webinars. However, maybe for the next few webinars, because of scheduling conflicts, we might actually have it on a weekend. I don't know if it's that's going to be better or worse, but I'd like to get over uh, all of the planned topics within June because there could be more topics based on the feedback in, in past webinars. There could be other topics that uh, will be relevant uh, beyond the topics that we've discussed already. So uh, this episode will be about uh, AI ethics, safety, and regulation. So th this is a topic that's been in the news, in the, in the blogs, uh, on LinkedIn, on, on social, and I thought this is really a good um, time to just get a grip on all of the hype around AI. As I mentioned before, the hype in AI seems to be negative compared to other uh, technology trends. So let's see why that is potentially the case. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Doc Ligot. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I've been working in the data field for uh, more than when going on 25 years, actually, and in AI, uh, a little under 10 years. Uh, I started out as uh, in banking. So that's my banking look right there. And then after almost 14 years in banking, I went into IT and then started my company. So for those of you who've been watching this series for the past few, uh, probably a month, um, why am I doing this? Again, uh, this is really a public service. So I'm not charging for this. Uh, my intention is to spread broad awareness on AI. Uh, it's targeted both to technical and non-technical audiences. So I try my best to keep the terminologies very simple, but uh, try not to lose the essence of what we're discussing. It's really to spur discussion and practical adoption of AI. That's really my mission now. Uh, uh, I've decided to dedicate the, the, the remaining productive years of my life which hopefully is still a lot, uh, towards uh, encouraging adoption of AI in the Philippines. And adoption is a function of information and education. So here we are. I also want to address a lot of the alarmist claims about uh, AI. So as I said, it's very negative now about AI. So I want to understand why that is. And this is also, there's so, only so much we can discuss in an hour or less. So this is really an 18,000 feet view. Most of the material here, I've tried my best to put references but I've also mixed up my personal views as well. Uh, all of this is public and open source, so feel free to reuse it in your own uh, education or if you want to reshare it. And uh, this webinar is, is live streamed on Facebook and it will be uploaded in YouTube in, in a quick fashion. So those links are also open for sharing. And definitely I welcome feedback on the whole series. And if you want to discuss uh, any, any topic, uh, once the series is over, I'm open to uh, additional topics because there's just so much about AI that hasn't been discussed yet. And uh, some people have suggested changing the format uh, into something like, like a podcast or uh, an interview. Yes, I actually plan to do that, uh, but I wanted to get a lot of the preliminary material out first. So that's why I'm just doing it by myself. And then later we can revisit some of the topics, maybe in conversation with someone else. Okay, so the, the the registration for this episode, I don't know if it's because we missed a week, was a, was a, was lower than the previous. So I'm wondering if that's because of the topic, because the topic sounds very dry, and you know it's something that people don't want to talk about. But still, 
the people who registered, interestingly, um, a big chunk come from the education sector um, and almost equal parts in the other sector. So professional services includes consulting, may finance, uh, some doctors, hospitals, but the chunk is education. And the pop question for the registration was, what kind of regulation feels attractive to you, you know, for one reason or another? And majority said, actually, uh, guidelines and education. So this is like soft regulation. I'll discuss this later. Uh, a few people mentioned licensing and clinical trials or documentation and transparency. I mean, these are all good. In fact, if you look at the industries that mentioned licensing and documentation, they actually come from the academe. No? Uh, but everyone else uh, seemed to really say, we need, we need guidelines, not necessarily hard regulation. So guidelines like the ISO certification, something like that. So it's more of a reward if you achieve uh, or uh, a code of conduct. And of course, they want more people to learn. And I think that's that makes sense because it's really going to be hard to regulate something you don't understand. And I meant, I made a mention of that in the first webinar. Uh, we're, we're certainly uh, regulating out of fear and we shouldn't do that. In terms of the keywords coming out, uh, it's very consistent. Everyone, uh, people mentioned ISO, standards, education. Finland came up uh, and there's actually a context for this. Um, I, I think in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, right before the pandemic lockdowns, Finland, uh, the, Finnish, the Finnish government made an announcement that they were targeting to educate 1% of people in Finland in artificial intelligence. And they actually quickly accomplished that goal. So now their current goal is to educate 1% of European uh, citizens, uh, uh, citizens of the EU in AI. And I really find that very inspiring and fascinating, very encouraging. Can you imagine if 1% of Filipinos uh, understood AI? That's about more than a million. What kind of innovation that might spur? So in my head, that's also something that I'd like to pursue. Okay, so let's get to it. So another rabbit hole, so to speak. So for AI ethics, safety, and regulation, I'll, I chopped up the topic into four parts. First, I'll talk about something that might be hard to understand. So I, I'm going to try my best to break it down into terms that everyone can relate to. And this is the alignment problem. This is really the core issue that most people who are advocating for AI regulation or lobbying for uh, you know, uh, some sort of ethics uh, committee, they're really worried about alignment. So it's good that we tackle alignment. Na. Let's understand what that is. Then uh, as an extension of that, I want to also focus on how ChatGPT was actually built uh, because most people, they use it, but they might not understand how it actually was trained vis-a-vis -vis other types of machine learning or AI. No? Uh, so ChatGPT isn't, uh, you know, so even people who actually work within with machine learning may not be familiar with how it was trained. So it's very good to understand it because it's very connected to how uh, the alignment problem uh, uh, works. And then, then I want to dive into algorithms because ChatGPT is not the first algorithm we've dealt with. So just to run down uh, what are the safety, the observed safety issues already with existing algorithms. And that will pave the way for the last part which is I want to discuss uh, somehow how do you approach regulation and vis-a-vis -vis ethics? Because ethics and regulation are not the same thing. You know, being ethical doesn't mean just following the law. You have to actually go beyond the law. And uh, funny enough, following the law doesn't necessarily make you ethical because <laughs> there are some people who stay legal within the law, but they're actually getting away with unethical stuff. So if you find that uh, interesting conflict, uh, let me know what you think. Okay, so the backdrop of this uh, really is the recent news. No? So this is all within the last month. Parang all of the AI experts, the godfathers of AI, have suddenly come out in public. So see Jeff Hinton is one of the longtime pioneers in machine learning. He actually quit his job at Google, and now he's talking openly about an urgent problem with AI, more urgent than climate change, almost akin to nuclear Armageddon. Ganon sila magsalita. And then Sam Altman, the cool CEO of OpenAI, who developed uh, the company that developed ChatGPT, has also appeared in front of the Congress. And he was talking about 
uh, regulating AI. So that's funny, you know, the, the top developers are also the ones lobbying for regulation. And I want to contrast this with just a, probably a year or two ago, no? So when Elon Musk took over Twitter, right around the same time ChatGPT became public, the first thing he did was fire the ethical AI team from Twitter. Diba? And of course, the talk there was, well, they're cost-cutting and the ethical AI team you know, wasn't really adding value. Yeah, but it, it, fe- it felt weird no, as an optic to be, to be cutting an ethics team, especially with regards to Twitter, which is a hotbed for disinformation, no, almost as bad as Facebook. And then uh, about a couple of years before that, uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru of Google was also let go by Google. Uh, and she was let go after she started uh, making her claims uh, public about how the internal environment in Google was also unethical, particularly around issues of race and gender. And then suddenly she was let go. Actually, Dr. Gubru bounced back very quickly. She's now running an NGO of her own or is part of another NGO looking at these issues. So it's nice to keep tabs on what these people are doing. So ganyan yung ano, no? the, that's the environment. Suddenly, uh, a couple of years later, biglang 180, including Elon Musk. He was one of the people who signed that uh, parang, ano, letter asking for a pause in development. And we have to wonder, why did, what, are, why, what are they afraid of? Why are they doing that? And to do that, we have to deep dive first into kind of the nature of these systems. No? It's a shame that actually not many people are here. Pero sana over... Facebook man lang and YouTube, people pick this up. So we'll start with the alignment problem. So what is alignment? First, let's talk about kind of the pop terms. No? You might hear things like ANI, AGI, ASI. So these are terms used to describe AI. I think generally speaking, it's more how does AI compare to humans? No? So if you are ANI, you're an AI with narrow capabilities which is basically every AI that exists today, <laughs> to be honest. You know, AGI, this is AI that's already at par with humans. And ASI is super intelligence. This is AI that actually surpasses humans. To be really accurate, as far as I know, AGI and ASI do not exist. This, that's still science fiction. But oddly enough, in case also you don't know, that's actually the goal of these companies. So see Google, they've seen a deep mind, Google Brain, OpenAI. Their mission is to create AGI. Because in their minds, AGI is the last uh, invention man will ever need to develop. Because once may AGI, na, it will solve most of our problems. But then, ngayon, 180 sila, they're saying, baka AGI might be the end of humanity. So that's kind of interesting. But to be clear again, unless uh, you know further advice, uh, AGI and ASI systems are just labels. They don't exist. Any, a, any AI we have now, even ChatGPT, despite its uh, interesting abilities, is still very narrow. Then uh, if you remember, some of you remember from the, from the first webinar, we distinguished generally two types of AI, no? the discriminative AI and the generative AI. So what's that? Well, in a, in a nutshell, it's, it's a, it, they may use similar processes, uh, and data, but the way the AI deals with it is different. No? So this is a simpler way to view it. The discriminative type of AI, uh, this is an AI that uh, renders a judgment or creates a label no? or gives you a forecast depending on the data that you have. So you, you feed a picture to the discriminative AI, the AI might tell you, oh, that's a cat or that's not a cat. So you give input or data and then the AI gives you a conclusion no, or a guess. While the generative AI works differently, you give the generative AI uh, an, a data point and it creates more data points. Like you give it a picture of a cat, it will give you variations of the cat. Parang ganun. And then in the case of Sinachat GPT, you give it a prompt, like the word cat, and it gives you a picture of the cat. So uh, it may use similar math. In, in some cases, the, the algorithms are similar, but the purposes are different. No? So that's the that's the big divide. And most of the AI up until recently in popular use was of the discriminative discriminative kind. So pag may nakita kang kunyari, it's used a lot in business, like in banking, you have credit scoring, that's a type of AI that gives a judgment on the borrower whether they're credit worthy or not. Parang ganun, or you can do mga time series analysis, you have like a trend, 
that you want to forecast. So you give it, parang sa ano sa financial markets, no? You give it data up until recently, and then it will project forward what the likely trend might be. That's also discriminative. While generative is like stable diffusion, you give it a prompt, it gives you an image, or deep fakes, you give it a picture, it gives you another picture, parang ganun. And of course, the chatbot, you give it a series of words, sasagot siya. That's generative AI. Now let's peel back the onion one more layer. What the mechanism that AI uses to work is machine learning. So means na paghahalo yung dalawa. Machine learning is actually the process that makes AI possible. AI is the kind of the overall system or the product. And so machine learning, again, hopefully this doesn't confuse many people. There's a there's at least three major types. Pwedeng ipaghalo-halo yan, but uh, for simplicity, let's look at three types of learning. The supervised learning, the unsupervised learning, and the reinforcement learning. You know? And again, you more popular up until recently were the first two, supervised and unsupervised. And then now, sumisigat na yung third. So what are they? Again, supervised learning is the process that the AI uses to do a prediction. So you give it some data, it makes a prediction. The prediction can be a classification, which is this thing on the left. Uh, like you give you a cat, a picture of a cat, it tells you if it's a cat or not. Or a regression, which is more of a forecast based on a trend. You know? While in unsupervised learning, the main difference in the supervised learning, kasi you already fed the, the, the AI or you fed the machine learning examples of what you're looking for. So for, for an AI to determine what a cat looks like, binigyan mo na siya ng mga past examples of a cat na nakalabel na. So that AI uses all of that past information to, uh, to project. No? Ah, okay, I know the pattern of what a cat looks like. Ito yung cat. Whereas in unsupervised learning, you don't need to tell the AI what you're looking for. You may not even know what you're looking for. Because in unsupervised learning, you're, you're basically letting the AI tell you basically the characteristics of the data. Can you group these data points into like clusters or communities because I want to see what are the anomalies. So iba yung perspective niya. So supervised, you know what you're looking for. The AI kind of automates that decision. While in unsupervised, you don't know what you're looking for and the AI is the one that looks for patterns. They're both useful. They're used for different things and they can be used together. So you might feed a data set into an unsupervised learning uh, process. May identify na niya na mayroon palang parang three groups of, uh, let's say, people and one group ends up being, let's say, in healthcare, people with cancer. No? And then using that information, you can then create an, a supervised learning model. Na, oh, kilala ko na lahat na may cancer. Can you give me the odds that this other data point has cancer? Parang ganun. So in business and science, there's a lot of work being done in this, ano, in this uh, uh, space. No? Now, what's reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is... Uh, it works differently. It's about giving an agent the ability to interact with an environment. So this is probably the closest to kind of the traditional definition of uh, uh, you know, uh, machine learning. So maybe these examples will make it clearer. No? Pag supervised learning, para kanina, you're classifying pictures of cats and dogs, or you have a forecast. While in unsupervised learning, you're giving you're giving the, the algorithm some uh, data points and bahala siya maghanap ng groupings. While reinforcement learning, it became popular sa games. No? So if you've heard of AlphaGo, this is the, the, the AI that beat yung top Go player. And this is the AI also that started playing Atari games and trying to figure out new ways of beating the games. No? So when you think about reinforcement learning, in my view, this is probably the close, closer to the Hollywood AI that people are worried about. Kasi nag-iisip na siya ng sarili niya. No? And the reason for that is the way the algorithm is designed, it's basically an interaction between an agent and an environment. So may mga rules kang ilalagay. Like in chess, the environment is the chessboard and the rules are how the pieces move. And the agent will decide what is the fastest way to checkmate the opposite uh, color. And yung checkmate na yan, that's called a kind of a reward. You're giving the machine parang uh, an incentive like, like a score. And the role of the algorithm is to maximize that score. Or actually, maraming ways of defining a goal. Pero just for simplicity's sake, yan yung, ano niya, yung goal niya. Now, the reason why I went to some detail to describe all of this is because this is where the fun begins. No? When you have these automated algorithms thinking like this, how could they go wrong? Huh? 
So one one way we can look at is misclassification. Parang this is a classic ano. Uh, is it a puppy or a bagel? Kasi mukhang from far away pareho lang sila. And actually the machine learning makes the mistake kasi it only uses visual cues, no? Doesn't know how to tell the difference between a dog or or a pastry. Ito yung mas malala. Is it a chihuahua or a raisin bread? Kasi the data is from an absolute Kasi pretend you're, you don't know anything about chihuahuas and ano and raisin. All you had to do, all you had to go with was the photo. You will really misclassify. So this is a natural limitation of basically any machine learning. You're only as good as the data that you feed it. No? Another limitation of machine machine learning, because they're based kasi on mathematics. That's that's the charm. No, a problem is math doesn't necessarily represent reality. It's kind of a contrived model. No? That's how that's how math works. So, itong example on the left, one of my favorites. This is an this is an illustration of how a forecast can change depending on the data na pinifeed mo. So, as more and more data gets fed, <clears throat> the red line, which is the forecast, gets more accurate. Pero the only time the red line was actually accurate was dun sa dulo where you had most of the data already. At the at the start, uh, if you remember yung COVID pandemic, everyone was putting out forecasts right and left. Talagang you have to expect those forecasts are flawed, which is sometimes kind of a humbling experience because if you're used to doing forecasts, syempre, sana na sana ka with data. By definition, all forecasts are wrong up until the end, no? And then itong, if you can read this on the diagram on the right, this is called Anscombe's Quartet. No? Uh, it's a classic uh, illustration in statistics where in statistics kasi you have all of these measures, no? correlation, mean, variance, etc. And the way Anscombe designed it is all of these four examples have the exact same correlation, mean, variance, or maybe it's slightly different. Pero yung itsura ng data iba iba. If you look closely, no? That's sila 81 correlation, that's sila mean of 9, variance of 11. And then the line also is exactly the same. The equation is exactly the same. But if you look at the layout of the dots visually, they're different things. So yun yung, yun yung danger. If you rely too much on mathematics, uh, that's the danger. Uh, you, you're by definition not capturing reality. And you could make very big mistakes. And fortunately, when you have machine learning and AI, the automation is based on math. So you carry that issue forward, what could happen? So pag nasa reinforcement learning ka na, that's where it come, becomes uh, crystallized. So this is a, an illustration of an agent playing a game. So the boat is meant to accumulate as many points as possible by going through a racetrack. Pero natutunan ng machine na you can accumulate unlimited points by never finishing the track and just getting all of the bonus items. Yun yung ginagawa niya. So, uh, so over time, nung pinaulit-ulit yung game sa kanya, eh yung goal was just simple. Maximize the number of points you can get. It found a totally different solution to what people were expecting. And that is the alignment problem in a nutshell. Where if you give a machine, an automated algorithm, a goal, you may not realize how that machine will achieve the goal. O, Think about that for a moment. So itong paikot-ikot na boat na to, it's actually doing the goal, but it's not accomplishing the intended objective of finishing the, the racetrack. Kasi nakahanap siya ng loophole. And this is not a, an odd example. This is a common example. Every time you design an automated system, machines may find a solution that you did not intend. So this is an illustration of the alignment problem no, in a nutshell. We're borrowing an analogy from accuracy and precision is where it came from. So in statistics, if something is accurate, it's close to the bullseye. But if for it to be precise, your guesses have to be near each other. So you can have something that's precise but inaccurate or accurate but imprecise. And depending on the problem you're solving, one is better than the other. So ganyan din yung alignment. You can have something that's capable but not aligned or aligned but not capable. What are what do these terms mean? So those who are studying the alignment problem differentiate between capability or how well a model or an AI is able to optimize its function. No? Parang yung kanina, the boat, if the function was to maximize the score, now optimize niya yung function niya. Capable siya. But is it aligned? Aligned kasi is how well does the model reflect the intention of the modeler? 
So in that example, the boat was capable but misaligned. And this is where it gets really crazy because uh, you know, some, some easy you know, hypothetical example, you give an AI that's, I don't know, let's say the AI has the capability to influence hospital operations and you give it an order to minimize cancer uh, cases, it might just decide to murder all of the cancer patients and it would have achieved the goal. Yun yung hypothetical extreme examples, just to give you an idea of how alignment works or doesn't work. At the same time, I, I, I'm, I'm actually shocked. Many uh, you know, experts don't bring this up. Um, there's a term called model drift. By, by definition, if you create an AI or you do machine learning, you're training it on an existing data set. But that data set is a sampling lang of data in the world. No, no matter how big that data, you'll never capture all the data. And even if you did, the next day you're already a sample because there's new data being generated. So that's the thought. Now, the danger is when you say drift, the original model may not be accurate anymore because the nature of the data changed between the time you accumulated the data and then the time today, or the data had quality problems. So for example, if you trained an algorithm to uh, maximize shopper experience, but in the original data set, it was mostly men doing the shopping, you know, just hypothetically. But then now it's mostly women doing the shopping. So men and women's habits might be different. So the AI will probably make mistakes because the new data does not mimic the old data. And that's also part of an alignment issue where the environment in training no longer rep, uh, captures the environment in reality. And that's really hard to control. Your best approach there is to retrain the model. But most of the times, these models aren't retrained, with a few exceptions. Though. Which, which brings us to ChatGPT. Oh, I hope you guys are still following. So ChatGPT is an example of um, an unsupervised AI uh, or machine learning, but was also enhanced by reinforcement learning. Okay, I'll explain what, what that means. Uh, first, let's distinguish between a GPT and a ch and chat GPT. Let's say GPT is kind of the base model. It's called generative pre-trained transformer. It's a model that's designed to predict a word based on previous words that were given to the model. So you say, I love, the next word is probably you, no? That's all that GPT does. Now, chat GPT is actually a process that's put on top of the GPT. It's a chatbot. And it was trained not just to uh, use the GPT to predict uh, answers based on questions. It was also trained to mimic humans. You know? And that was for, to correct for the alignment problem. So for example, a GPT can work like this. No? There's usually two approaches. One is tokenization and one is masking. So for example, the cat sat on the blank union token. Uh, based on all of the data that the GPT learned, it could give you mat, chair, or floor as the highest probability of that word. Or within a sentence, the blank sat on the something, that is a mask that could be cat, dog, or rabbit based on some probabilities. And that's actually all it does. No? And that's the problem. GPTs are only giving you statistically accurate language. It doesn't understand it. It sounds like it does, but it doesn't. So the ability to produce an accurate sentence is capability lang, no? but it may not be aligned. So when they developed, the earliest GPTs were just like this. No? And that's why they were all barely usable at that time. But then they added another process uh, in, in, in chat GPT called reinforcement learning through human feedback, RLHF. And what was that for? Uh, actually, they used to they did this to correct the alignment problem. Because ang nangyayare, the sentences were accurate statistically, but they were meaningless to the person asking the question, or they were not intended. So the life hack they did was, can we teach this GPT to write like a human? So the human is the template, okay? And of course, that implies some other problems, which I'll get into later. So it was three steps. I'll just briefly go through them. The first step was. They actually hired humans to answer questions. So here's a big list of questions. And I think they hired 10,000 people from Kenya or something. Please answer these questions. And all of those answers were put into a database. So 
it came from humans, no? And that was put in a in a model no? to fine tune the existing GPT. Then step two, since the model now has examples of what humans said, let's do another round. But this time, let the model be the one to suggest answers. Okay, so when you're here, here's a question, and then the model would provide four answers. But then they'll hire another set of humans. Can you rate the answers that the model did? So you don't have to answer on behalf of the model. The model's answering already. But then you let the humans grade the answer no? in terms of uh, you know, uh, how good they are. And that rating system was put in another model. That's the important part. Huh? The original model was just uh, a fine tuning of the original GPT. But then a separate model was created to capture the scoring that was being done by humans. So yun yung dalawang point na yun. And now you have two models that can now basically fight with each other because that's often done in machine learning. You have two models competing with each other. One model called the policy model will answer a question. And then the other model, the reward model, will rate the answer. And the policy model will train itself again and again and again until it maximizes the score. Parang yung boat kanina. So the reward is the score. And that's how they were able to train tons and tons of data very quickly based on an initial you know, uh, set. No? Sounds very elegant. No? But this is actually, didn't really solve the alignment problem, actually created more alignment problems, which I'll explain in a minute. But just to summarize, well, what I would call any other machine learning before this was very simple. You have an input and you have an output uh, and the parameter is what modifies the input to get the answer. And then you have errors. No? When you're forecasting, or you're guessing wrong, it's not a cat, actually a dog. So the number of times you're guessing wrong is an error. And then the way you train it is you keep running that exercise again and again and modify the parameter until the error is minimized. That's pretty much how most machine learning works. Pero sa RLHF, you have a third player, which is the reward. So not only are you calculating errors and modifying the policy, which is the original parameter, but then you're also influenced by the reward. So parang ganun. it becomes uh, self, uh, in a way, self-supervised at some point. No? Now, here's the challenge. Um, the point of RLHF is to align nga with humans. But humans are also not aligned with each other. That's, I think, that's the, one of the big flaws with that experiment. Uh, and then the way you measure alignment I think people haven't actually agreed on it. There are some proposals. So this was in the original paper of uh, uh, a predecessor of ChatGPT. No? Metrics uh, are like, how helpful is the model? So that's based on human in, uh, no, feedback. How truthful is the model? But depending on who you ask, the truth can be malleable. No? And how, how harmful or harmless is the, is the answer? No? So as you can see, these three items... Although conceptually, these are, um, you know, uh, they make sense to a person. Because you know, we don't operate in terms of hard rules. Eh? We operate in terms of heuristics, no? guidelines. So these are examples of guidelines that you might give a person. But for a machine, you need to give it like hard, you know, scores and facts. And that's the current challenge no? with this. So some uh, problems with RLHF that have, uh, been documented. Number one, the labelers are not perfect. Some people in Kenya might label something good or bad depending on their preference. No, uh, The researchers are also not perfect. So the way you design the study and the instructions, that can be completely biased and flawed. No? Uh, the choice of prompts could also be biased. Because by definition, you don't know how every human will ask questions. And finally, the labelers are also biased in terms of calculating the reward. So on all fronts, your attempt to actually correct the alignment actually uh, created more misalignment. You know? So let that may, may just sit with you guys muna for a few seconds. Though. How do you fix this? That's the current debate. Kaya when people said, let's pause muna experiments, they're actually not referring to current AI. They're, cur they're referring to more powerful AI. But the issue was, we don't understand how this thing can be corrected. So if you create more powerful models we might not be able to correct for it. And the implications might be massive. That's kind of the science fiction behind the, the letter. Uh, but it's actually being misinterpreted by many people na parang any AI na lang can be bad. Yes and no. Uh, or banning AI for that matter. That's also another issue. 
So maybe to contextualize it, so put RLHF muna aside. No? Let's talk about existing algorithms. You know, how, how have they fared? So again, in a nutshell, any machine learning operates on similar principles. You have existing data, uh, and then you have a, a mathematical process to learn a pattern by minimizing errors. No? And then based on that pattern, new data is created. Ganun lang siya, a straightforward no? uh, if you compare all of it. Now, this process is capable of achieving a lot of great things, but then we have to now start breaking it and seeing where it could go wrong. So to do that, let's talk about four uh, algorithms that everyone uses without even thinking. No? Uh, and many people don't even consider na AI pala yan. My favorite app is Waze because it gets me places. It's based on a, a, a machine learning process called shortest path. So given a network of streets, what's the shortest distance between point A and B? That's all it does. But you don't need to be a rocket scientist to use it. In addition to that, it, it actually in, uh, uh, considers crowdsourced data. So there are volunteers. You can volunteer as well that they, they add data or modify the map. For example, sometimes sarado yung kalsada, this road is closed, or sometimes it's one way. Exactly that. No? So it's a very elegant system. No? I love it uh, when it first came out. Now, I'm sure the creators of Waze didn't realize that it could result in fatalities. Like in the case of Israeli soldiers in Palestine, they were using Waze to navigate the back streets no, of the West Bank. And of course, no one will crowdsource the location of the Palestinians. They, they ran into some Palestinians, which is a very, very likely hazard going through back streets. And there was a skirmish and they died. Uh, an earlier case, which I love quoting, is in 2015, a couple was vacationing in Brazil, uh, the Murmura couple, and they just misspelled the, the destination. They were headed to a resort in Rio de Janeiro, and instead of getting to, I don't know the name, you know, Parang Punta del Sol, they put Punto del Sol or something like that. And that was not the resort. It was actually a slum area in Rio de Janeiro, and there was a gang war happening, so bad luck, and Regina Murmura got shot and died. So if you're the developer of Waze, would you have found that use case? That's the hard part. Eh? It's always, it's always uh, best determined uh, in, uh, no, in, in practice. No? And see some people dropping comments on the chat. Please continue to do so later. We'll discuss it. Okay, next example. Uh, social media operates on the similar principles. TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, etc. They operate on the basis of similarities. No? And you try to find similarities with other users or activities. So here's a classic one. Sally likes mojitos. And because of Su uh, their data, the algorithm finds Susan, who looks very similar to Sally. So it will recommend mojitos to Susan. This is why social media in general is very hungry for data. It's a big privacy issue because it's a marketing tool. So it finds data points that allow you to target people. No? Now, another case can be Sean, who also likes mojitos. And since Sally likes mojitos and Sean likes mojitos, maybe Sean might also like Havaianas, which, all, which Sally likes. So this two types of filtering is the most common way of uh, recommending items, whether you're looking at e-commerce, recommended videos on YouTube, news feeds, one is user-based, one is item-based. Of course, you know, the current practices is very ano na, no? advanced, but the premises are similar. So that's a very cool tool, you know, very elegant. What could go wrong with that? Well, that's precisely the reason why I would argue that social media is very toxic because the only data you see is data you probably will like. So you're deprived of a more balanced information flow. That's why you noticed in more recent years, it's very toxic on social media, especially around politics. No? You're now in an echo chamber, and that's by design. It's not accidental. But you know, people, from a marketing standpoint, it makes sense. But from for everything else, it doesn't work. Like in the case of the Rohingya people, they're a minority in Myanmar. They were targeted for genocide by the Myanmar military using Facebook's targeting mechanism. And that targeted attack was undetected by Facebook for a long time, years, in fact, because number one, it was using micro-targeting, and number two, the language being used in the ads was not English, it was Burmese, which, again, that's another AI problem. Now, you model drift, all of these language detection algorithms were trained on English, and then the real data palace in Burmese algorithm won't spot it. 
So now you see about, um, you know, uh, how that can be damaging. No? Okay, third example. This is a very complicated slide. Just in a nutshell, this is a typical facial recognition process used in, let's say, passport uh, preparation, etc. No? So you have someone takes a photo, the photo is stitched, and then an algorithm determines if the photo is compliant or not. Ganun lang siya simple. The way the algorithm was trained was on many, many images. So this is like supervised learning. And then some images were marked correct and wrong. And then that, that forms the basis for uh, giving you the uh, no, instructions. That's very simple. How can that go wrong? Well, it can go wrong if the data you used was not uh, uh, no, fair no, or it does not represent the reality. This is also an issue of model drift no, or data drift where maybe all of the, the faces you used to train the model were Caucasian, but the reality is you'll have a very mixed ethnicity in real life. And that's exactly what happened in the UK, where Richard Lee on the left couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his eyes were closed. But his eyes were just small. No? Or see Joshua Bada on the right. The algorithm thought his mouth was open. But the reality was he just had big lips. So these are ethnic minorities that the algorithm couldn't figure out because the algorithm was based on Caucasian faces. So you can turn an algorithm into racist algorithms just by omission on the data itself. So that's also the, uh, kind of hard to accept. And then I guess one of the most controversial uh, processes to come out in recent years is deep fakes, where it's generative AI. You're, you feed an algorithm so many examples of faces it can now replicate a face uh, ano, uh, flawlessly. No? In fact, you can swap faces, you can match lips to audio, so you can make Obama say, say things he never did, or you can transfer styles no, between one photo to another. So I like this face, but can you make her African? So it will find the, kind of the median between an African face and that person's face. So it's really great for art and creative uses. But what if you, know, you use it for politics? No? This is an example of an experiment we did, just swapping faces between two politicians. You can even do swapping between dead politicians and live politicians. And I guess it's, it's good for academic purposes. But can you imagine if the news feeds were dominated now by video that you couldn't tell was correct? That's the problem with this kind of technology. And in the past, it used to require really, really powerful computers. These experiments were done on a laptop, modern laptops now. 16 gig RAM and video cards. Uh, it takes under an hour to process. So think about that in the hands of disinformation agents. So as I said, all of these are old technologies. No? So what about the newest ones? The chatbots and the, the ito, mga image generators. No? Well, of course, one of the first things that people realized is the chatbots hallucinate. In other words, they're giving you statistically correct uh, text but it may not be actually factual information-wise. And that's the reason for that is people mistakenly assume that the chatbots are retrieving data from somewhere, parang database yan or Google search. They're not. They're actually writing original text every time you ask. But it was trained because of the RLHF and the uh, ano, unsupervised learning. It was trained on examples of real text. So it, it looks uh, correct. But when you audit the, the veracity of the info, mali. and people weren't ready for that. So I think that's more of an issue of maybe bad advertising. You know, People were not guided properly and people were also maybe not tested because they kind of say, one of the first things that people said when ChatGPT came out is Google is now in trouble because people were not search, I use search engines anymore, they'll use the chatbot. And I thought that's not exactly the use case for a chatbot. Although there are more modern, uh, more recent chatbots that are actually using search engines already to get data and then interpreting it. That's not necessarily foolproof because some of the data you find on the search is also wrong. And then you have these unintended user interactions. Like there was a man who committed suicide. It didn't need to chat GPT. There was another chatbot. But because the chatbot was so convincing, so human-like, and that conversation went into weird depths that people didn't expect. The man went suicidal. And then this is very recent, no? the other day lang to. Uh, a woman marries a virtual husband. There's actually a, a service called Replica 
which is a chatbot with an avatar. No? And the whole point of it is to have a virtual friend. If you don't have anyone to talk to and you need someone to talk to, maybe a virtual counselor, that's what Replica does. But the Replica AI have become so lifelike and so uh, convincing, people have actually fallen in love with them. And that's what's happening. In the world of image generation, things aren't looking good either. So one of the biggest problems now is copyright. So this example on the right is the ongoing lawsuit of Getty Images against Stability AI or the creator of Stable Diffusion. The idea here is Getty AI owns a massive archive of copyrighted images. And it looks like Stable Diffusion used that uh, repository. In fact, you can even see the, the logo no, of uh, Getty, it's blurred. Because uh, the image generation uh, AI are so advanced that they can use similar cues from an existing photo, but they're creating a totally original photo. That's actually the gray area now with copyright. It's not the photo, but inspired by a photo that may have been copyrighted or trademarked. But in this case, in this specific case, baka talo si Stable Diffusion dito kasi they also infringed on the actual Getty Images logo. No? So trademarks are stricter compared to general copyrights because any modification of a trademark can be, you know, can be construed as an infringement. But the whole idea here was, did you technically copy an image or just get uh, got inspired by it? That's the debate. And in fact, interestingly, Japan, the government of Japan, just a week ago, declared that uh, AI will not be subject to copyright law in Japan, at least the training part. So companies, uh, or what do you call this, the... Uh, countries are going to weigh on this one way or another. We actually have a pending house bill right now uh, that looks to ban any website using generative AI that infringes on an, uh, an, an artist. I mean, on paper, it sounds, it sounds good, but who's going to judge whether it was an infringement or not? No? It's like a censorship question mark. And then uh, some of these image generators are so realistic that if you didn't know it was satire, you might have actually thought it was true. So this is an example of a series of images that uh, an online uh, AR, an AI artist online are shared around. It's these famous characters in Divisoria, <laughs> Biden, and I know what's this Prince William having, I know having Taho or having Isao. Everyone, well, at least most people I know knew it was uh, satire. But what's the fine line between satire and disinformation? That's the question. So, for example, this image on the right, this was uh, actually called out by some journalists as uh, kind of fake news. And you can tell because for some reason, the image generators occasionally get the fingers wrong. No? This, this police ha a policeman has six fingers. Pero it was done at the height of the France uh, riots. No? So how do we know this was not satire, but the Biden one was satire? Hard, no? That's the challenge. And then now, more recently, we have music already being invaded by AI. So there's a song that was not done by Drake, but it was done in the style of Drake. Uh, I don't know the title of the song, Heart on My Steviata or something like that. And it went viral. You know? And that was the surprise. People thought, oh, AI-generated music can't compete with uh, actual musicians. Nope, <laughs> it can. To the point that the music label who handled Drake uh, uh, requested that that uh, AI generated song be be taken down. No? So is that correct or not? And then ito, this is a uh, literally last night. Uh, people are filling in uh, voices of dead Beatles no? in songs and recreating the the Beatles songs based on a no? learned audio. That's interesting. No? So again, this is an ongoing debate. It's not settled yet. And uh, actually, I'll have a webinar about art and education. In, uh, in a couple of weeks. So maybe we'll tackle it there. But here's the question. If the, if the question is, is there any copyright infringement? Maybe that's a viable discussion. But the question is, uh, in some uh, cases, is, is it considered art or music? That's more of a subjective issue. Okay, so let's uh, bring it to kind of the, the crux of this. No? Uh, all of this points to kind of a need to come to some common ground in terms of how do we now use these technologies. No? I mean, recall that after World War II, there was the Geneva Convention and Geneva Protocol, basically to govern warfare. 
And the reason there was after World War One and Two, people were shocked at the amount of bloodshed at that time, no, uh, that the world experienced, culminating in the Hiroshima, Nagasaki, you know, atomic uh, bombs. So they said we have to regulate all of these weapons and you know weapons of mass destruction, which are also not just nuclear, no, biological weapons, have to be banned and controlled. So our people are saying, are we now at that level with AI? So I mentioned earlier. Uh, parang a year or two after Elon Musk fired his ano, ethics team in Twitter, he's now one of the people calling for a pause on AI, citing profound risks. No? And then si Sam Altman, appeared in, who was the CEO of ano, OpenAI, appeared in front of the Congress of U uh, the United States, also saying regulate. But then people can't help but wonder, is this just a ploy to monopolize the AI market? No? So... You know, it's one thing to say uh, we, we need to control this technology, but by regulating future research, they've already locked in their dominance. No? That's the conspiracy theory. Again, I don't know, but ano pa yan? Ni pa, ni pa decided. But let's go into some practical questions. No? So that's why we included some of those in the, in the questionnaire when you registered. When you say regulate, what do you really mean? Are you here to license people who are using AI or Treat it like building codes or building permits or debate? Or are you more about regulating the development, like in drugs? No? Drugs is probably the, the most uh, extreme version of this. For a drug to come out, it has to pass through several uh, mandated trials no? for safety and efficacy. And then when you get to the implementation, the professions are also split. The doctors can prescribe, but they can't dispense. The pharmacist can dispense, but not prescribe. So that was an intentional separation of duties to prevent abuse. Otherwise, doctors will be drug addicts. No? Some of them are <laughs> because they'll be prescribing medicines to whoever they want and getting, getting the medicines. Uh, are we talking more softer regulations like documentation and audit? Like the PIA of, a, of the National Privacy Commission, that's, uh, that's, that's not necessarily a, like a hard requirement. But you can use it as a hard requirement for procurement. Like, okay, if something funny comes out, you, you can review was the PIA accomplished, especially if it processes information. Like very recently, I shared a, a, an article about the national ID of the Philippines. And apparently, it doesn't seem as secure as, it, as we all thought. So one of the first things you can ask as a citizen, can we see the privacy impact assessment? Because we assume somebody you know, did the due diligence there. So it can be an audit tool. Are we talking more guidelines like ISO? So ISO is not necessarily a legal re requirement, but you, again, you can impose it on, re on procurement. Like, okay, we will only source AI from ISO certified vendors. And that assumes there's an ISO standard for AI. Actually, there is. No? It's being drafted. Or is it more like a code of conduct with you know, members of an association like AAP? Or like Data Privacy Act, it's a law, but it actually prescribes kind of steps that people can take in, in order to secure privacy data or the IPO. Or are we talking education like Finland or Project Sparta or social protection? Like uh, if there are fears that people's jobs will get uh, impacted, do we give them insurance, protect them from that? Or do we go for universal basic income, which is a bigger kind of a bigger topic? The idea there is if AI will end up eating all our jobs, most jobs, and then creating massive prosperity. Kailangan those two go together. So the jobs are eaten up, but because AI is so productive, GDP will grow. So there will now be an excess in terms of resources, which we can now redistribute to people. So dun mangagaling yung UBI. Again, I can't see it happening yet, no, myself. Or is it a hard ban, no? like punitive? You can't do this, you're illegal, like the cybercrime law. Again, I'm not advocating one or the other, but I think every time you hear someone say, we got to regulate AI, just for diligence, you ask them two questions. What AI are you talking about? Because there are many types. And two, how do you propose to regulate it? Because just saying you need to regulate it kind of doesn't work. No? And actually, I've been in an similar discussions very recently in AAP. We're actually drafting a position paper on this. And it's not settled yet, just to let you know. No? And then more importantly, who will enforce it? It's not like driver's licenses. You actually have to go to LTO to get it. 
uh, or building codes, you have to go to City Hall. So there's actually a central point of intervention. No? AI it is not centralized. You can just download stuff right and left, GitHub. You're going to regulate that. So I, I think that's really where it uh, boils down to. And, I'll, and again, this is not being political or anything. I'll just cite SIM card registration as an example. Uh, the premise was you want to prevent SMS spam and identity theft. So require everyone to get registered. And the, in theory, it makes sense because you have telco monopolies that you can use to enforce. But actually, the onus is not on the telcos. The onus is on the individuals unless you want to ban all of the SIM cards already. And so far, so good. Still being extended. And more importantly, this news on the right, a black market in registered SIMs has already emerged. I mean, we should not be shocked. Every time you have a regulation, there will be people who will try to circumvent it. So how do you now address that? No? There's no rule. Uh, ironically, the SIM card reg doesn't even cover that uh, illegal uh, selling of SIMs. It actually punishes the, pers the, the telco or the distributor of the SIMs if they allow a SIM to be sold without being registered. Pero yung mga nagwa black market conveniently out of the picture. Okay, we're nearly at the hour. No? Apologies for that. It's really a lot of material to go through. But I just want to quickly run through. Some of this is familiar ground to many of you who've been listening to me before. We have to bring it back to basics, I think. Moral hazard is one. It's a phenomena where if you have incentives to do bad behavior, then magulat if people do it, especially if the incentives seem to outweigh the risk. For example, in drug uh, trafficking, that's why people are drug mules because yes, you can go to jail if you're caught, but most of the time you're not caught and the rewards are massive. Kaya people still do it. And in terms of ethics spectrum, actually, I think this is already outdated, to be honest. But this is how I, uh, we've been viewing the situation for so long. Everyone starts at the privacy question, but then it's actually everything else after privacy that's the problem. Disinformation, ownership, discrimination, liabilities. I mean, it's really hard to sue an algorithm, right? Uh, and you can argue the person who wrote the algorithm is not directly responsible for its uh, use unless we apply other types of rules. And then on the ground level, you have quality and data poverty. So essentially, data can hurt you and data can be hard to use. And then these are very hard things to admit if you're now in a data-driven society. And again, the laws we have, they actually don't cover the ethics issues. They cover other things. No? Uh, looking at SIM card, anti-cybercrime, intellectual property code. And, and actually, this is a good indicator that we're actually in the fourth industrial revolution already because new laws are getting passed that are data-driven. No? I think there's a DNA database law that's about to be passed also and a, and a social, social media registration law that did a draft ng isang senator. So I think the bottom line here is compliance is not the only solution. It is one solution. But the ethics is more, for me, more proactive. We need to agree on a common ground in terms of ethical behavior. So what does that mean? No? And again, I didn't mean to get into a, an ethics lecture, but think of these three things whenever you think about ethics. It's not just about what you need to do under the law. That's the duty part. It's also about consequences. What happens if you do something, legal or illegal? And it's about virtue. That's actually, the virtue part is actually closer to religion. You don't have to be religious to be virtuous. What kind of character are you building? At the same time, uh, there's also existing ethical codes that might be useful. Belmont is a good one, in my opinion. It's, it's to govern bioethics and experiments in health and, and biology. No? And, it's, and bioethics principles of Belmont are quite straightforward. Respect people's autonomy. Uh, don't harm people. Or if, if, or if there will be harm, balance those uh, risks with uh, the uh, balance those harms with the benefits that your experiment will do. And then justice, it's a harder concept to swallow. You have to look at how do you, how do, you do it in a way that doesn't disparage uh, communities. And then in 2021, this is already almost three years old, UNESCO actually came up with a recommendation on the ethics of AI. I recommend uh, you, you find, uh, find time to read this if you haven't. Because 193 countries, including the Philippines, signed this. No? And it's grounded on some fairly broad, high-level principles. And it's, it's got a lot of recommendations that can actually be translated into regulation already. Of course, we, we can be selective. No? 
But in brief, the core values are about dignity, human rights, peace, diversity, and the environment. So basically, the SDGs. No? And then the 10 uh, core principles, yeah, ito core values. The principles start with proportionality, which is balancing harms and benefits. No? Safety, just like you would be safe about cars, we have to be safe about AI. Uh, privacy and data protection. Uh, collaboration. So it can't just be unilateral on the part of the government. You have to involve private sector, you have to involve the academia uh, and uh, minorities no? that uh, could be disparaged. Accountability and, uh, and responsibility, transparency and explainability. This is actually a big deal, tong number six, because the, the models being used for chat GPT are hardly transparent and explainable. You can explain the process, but what's going on inside these math calculations is quite opaque. It's because of the way the, the models are architected. It's almost near impossible to track what's happening with every calculation. Uh, oversight. Oh, so this is important. At some level, the machines will get so independent that you have to actually insist the humans are still consulted. And not everyone seems to agree that humans should still be in the loop. No? Uh, and the last three are about, I guess, the, the ideal society. We have to be sustainable. We have to be literate and we have to be fair. No? I also want to share as a one, kind of one of the last salvos. So uh, I was actually invited to support this group called the Ambit. So I'm happy, happy to be collaborating with them. Uh, basically, I represent them in this uh, uh, kind of this presentation. No? They were the first to come out with this uh, public petition aimed at the lawmakers. And these first five are, there's at least 15 parang points that they made. No? But these are the first five that uh, kind of the global principles. Carry forward the national AI strategy, which is a roadmap drafted by DTI as early as 2021. After they drafted it, parang wala nang follow up. That's my view. No? So why don't you just do that? Because it had a lot of good things in it. Uh, establish a governance committee, whether it's an actual government agency or not, you know, that's left to government to figure out. The UNESCO recommendations, just implement them because they're all good. Ensure that there's regional representation. This is a big problem I see everywhere in technology. It's always NCR lang. I mean, we don't, we don't involve other regions. And we need an upscaling uh, program. We cannot rely on the public to react to this properly if they're not educated. There are some early attempts at regulation. So these are the, the three that uh, I've seen. Uh, Senator Marcos is looking at job impacts. She's actually mentioning upskilling. It's not just about banning AI at all. No? It's more about training the call center workers to, to transcend their jobs if it's possible. See, si Salceda is uh, lobbying against uh, no, generative AI from a copyright standpoint. So if it affects uh, you know, copyright of artists, the government should be empowered to ban any media that does it. My question is always, how do you tell? No? And then Barbers is going, uh, going for a broader regulation, which is about consumer protection. So what do we do with that? So lastly, before we get to Q&A, uh, this came from an earlier study in 2022 on the state of talent in technology. No? And this, I found this graph very compelling. It's uh, how much of the talent pool how, uh, how big is our technical talent pool, like IT and you know, data science, as a percentage of our population? And then on the right, uh, the x-axis, what is our venture capital investment as a percentage of GDP? And literally, the Philippines is at the bottom left corner. We have some of the smallest talent pool. Remember, this is percentages. Huh? So that's why China has a lower percentage. But again, Philippines. And then in terms of investment, we're lit pretty much at the lowest, uh, no, lowest uh, rung no, in terms of investment. That's interesting. No? Parang, this is the single worst place to do uh, any technology play. And for me as a tech entrepreneur, I kind of reject that notion, but the stats don't lie. No? The top two places, uh, in case you were con uh, considering, is Singapore and Israel. So mm -hmm. if you have a way of going there, go there. <laughs> okay, to close this, reality check. So the six-month call for a pause in AI refers to more powerful models than what is in use today. Regulating AI is a broad term. 
we have to be specific. What are we regulating? So if you compare it to cars, regulating cars is easy since you have auto manufacturers. You can restrict them. But AI developers, they're many and they're decentralized. Uh, any form of regulation can also slow innovation. So we have to be very careful about that. We're actually at the bottom already. So it will be ironic if we're the first country to regulate AI. Pa, diba? But again, you know, there could be another way of doing it. And I like using this slide. No? Uh, I really, and it reflects no, with the audience we have. No? We probably have half of the original audience I had in the first webinar. And it's, I think, inevitable. No? This kind of discussion is, is something people don't like to engage with generally. Everybody's interested with data or AI. Uh, some are interested in uh, technology. Some are still interested in math, which is important. Pero really, ethics goes out the window. Okay, I'm a little over time, but uh, this this meeting the is until 1.30. So for those of you who are still around, uh, we can now have a discussion. But before that, uh, please uh, support my social media. Uh, I actually came back to Facebook recently after a 12-year hiatus. And the reason for that is I want to reach a broad audience, as broad as possible. I'm actually quite active on Twitter and LinkedIn. And believe it or not, I'm actually on TikTok, <laughs> Instagram, and YouTube, uh, it's a very different audience. So usually I just post videos no, on these latter three channels. Uh, but please, if you're on these channels, please follow or, or share. No? And then finally, uh, I think we're done with three topics already. Ah, no, two topics pa lang pala. So we talked about jobs last time. We're talking about ethics and regulation now. And we still have at least two more webinars to go. So following the priority, we'll talk about business and use cases and tools next. No? That might be more exciting. And then lastly, we'll also talk about art and copyright. Okay, so while we're doing the Q&A, uh, can I invite everyone to fill up the feedback form, bit.ly slash AI for lunch ethics. All right. I'll also use this as the mailing list for the ones who want to get the slides. No? So if you fill up the feedback form, you can get a copy of the material. Okay, so that's it. Uh, Let's do the Q&A. So I'll, I'll do the Zoom audience first, but I'll also, I also want to see what people are posting on Facebook if there is any uh, anything. So if you're on Facebook and you have uh, uh, questions or comments, please, uh, no, you, can, you, can, you can chime in there. No? Where's the links? Again, let's put the link of the... I'll actually post a couple of links. So I'll first post the link of the survey. AI for lunch. Ethics. I'll also post the link to the AMBIT. The AMBIT is actually a petition. So please uh, please support it. AI for lunch. Okay. The, the link is capital sensitive, apparently. So. Okay, I got it. So here's the here's the link. I'll also post the link to the AMBIT, uh, their petition. Okay, does anyone have any questions uh, that you want to highlight? I'll read the comments muna. AI for lunch ethics. Okay, that's the link to the the, uh, no, the survey. So, okay, let's go up. So, I think Josh had a comment. I found chat GPT meaningful in writing and optimizing codes in R. Yeah, actually, that's one of the best use cases for chat GPT to become a coding assistant. So it's not just about general info, it's about coding. No? So that's good. I hope people understand it may or may not provide truthful information. Yeah, as we discuss. Don't skip the literature, journal, article. Yeah, I think uh, one of the best use cases, but I'll discuss this also in the next webinar no, in more detail. It's really good for outlines. No? If you want to get an outline, ChatGPT is great. But the contents of the outline, I would imagine, is better if it's still human beings for now, no? Okay, Spola said, this is why Waze can be unreliable. Yeah. Have you ever been led astray by Waze? Like, you know, you've been sent to the middle of nowhere <laughs> because of, uh, because of the, you know, because of the, the directions. No? So it's, uh, it's really funny. Okay, what else? Um, Roland Banyas. In paper, it looks good. Sino to? Hi, Doc Ligot. What can you say about the recent move of Adobe? I think it's for survival because certainly Adobe represents 
up until recently the old uh, no, technologies in 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 art no? uh, i don't think photoshop will go away but a lot of the automation tools in adobe could be rendered moot by ai so it's good that they went into generative ai no? but ironically that makes it more dangerous because you can now integrate photoshop and ai generated data and you can literally fake an image and it doesn't look fake anymore yung mga manual adjustments kasi ng photoshop it is possible to detect it using image analysis tools pero the generative fill i you know i haven't checked personally but i think that will be invisible na to to image uh, ano, analysis kasi it will use ai generated ano eh, colors and cues and that's almost exactly if not exactly like an actual image that's why i usually don't memorize maps because waze doesn't know shortcuts no okay Waze doesn't include special access roads. Actually, I don't know if anyone heard about this. I was trying to look for an example locally of someone who got hurt by Waze. There's actually at least one, uh, the car that got stranded in the PNR. But I heard about this news a couple of years back pa, where someone was driving up mountain roads to, I don't know where, Isabella or Ilocos. And they literally fell off a cliff. Because according to Waze, there was a particular part in the mountain pass that had a bridge. Kasi crowdsourced yun. But the reality was the bridge was under construction. And some of these mountain roads were completely dark. No, ano, no uh, street lamps. So they fell and they died. But I haven't heard any mention of it anywhere. So I was trying to look for it. Josh, when I started learning about NLP, I don't skip surveys anymore. Okay. That's good. Some people do. Most people don't. Yeah, I mean, surveys is data gathering. Uh, as long as you're in agreement with what data you're being you know, uh, asked to donate, then that's fine. Okay, next. Uh, I think art styles cannot be copyrighted. The actual artwork is. Yeah, I mean, you can't copyright uh, ano ba? pointillism. <laughs> you can't copyright watercolor. It's actually still the work. And that's why it's kind of a gray area in favor of AI because AI is not a copyright on anything. It's using methods, no? Pero yun nga, in the Getty Images case, talagang the infringement was on the logo, no? Josh says, governing body, who will it be? Yeah, there's a couple of suggestions. Barbers wants something called AIDA, uh, Artificial Intelligence Development Agency. And again, if that's like NEDA, I don't know how effective it will be. Kasi are you going to be required to register models? Parang NTC ba yan? All of your phone devices get put there. It uh, doesn't feel like it's something workable. Okay. Not in the middle of nowhere, just in the middle of traffic. Yep. Tech training for AI literacy. Yes, actually, uh, well, we, as you, some of you might know, I was part of the Project Sparta initiative that actually already ended, but it's being extended by the AP. We need something like Finland. 1% of Filipinos should learn AI. Not necessarily the coding part, although that helps. Like the context of AI. No? And that might go a long way. Adobe have been implementing AI since 2012. Yeah. Yeah, actually, companies like Adobe are probably on top of the trend, if I'm not mistaken. No? Uh, it's, really, it's really inevitable that they will be part of this uh, discussion. Okay, I'll put my link on Facebook also. People. Wait, I'm, yeah. Okay, anyone else has a question? You can unmute if you want, no? Para you're also part of the also part of the podcast. Feel free to unmute or raise your hand if you want to, to be oh, called. Sir. Yeah, sir, go ahead. Um sir. You mentioned earlier, right, that the statistics about about our country being left behind in terms of tech training and AI. So based on that, will it take, let's say, a couple of years before we finally reach the level of Singapore and Israel, as you showed in the statistical data? I you know it's hard to tell. Eh. Uh, when will we be at the par at par with Singapore? Parang ano, no? If you ask me, never. <laughs> I say they're also going to improve. Parang the analogy was always how many years behind are we? No, uh, I don't know if we'll ever catch up. I think the best thing we can do, this is kind of a sideways 
parang answer to your question is we should focus on issues that are unique to the Philippines. Like for example, the call center question is certainly something we should be worried about because it affects us. Actually, as it stands now, if you do an analysis of the GDP, there are actually three big chunks to the GDP right now. One is OFW. The other is uh, call centers because that's a huge foreign currency income to us coming from the uh, offshoring entity. And uh, next is manufacturing, na, which is also partly parang BPO, mga PESA ano yan, eh, companies. And if you think about it, those three things are at risk. The call centers are potentially at risk because of the AI, although there are arguments that it's actually the other way around. Call centers could actually include AI and be more productive. So I hope that happens. The OFW problem, oh, ne, let's skip OFWs muna. Manufacturing has a problem now. The problem is we're not competitive anymore compared to Vietnam and Indonesia, cost-wise. And in terms of infrastructure, we're also not competitive. Our electric bills are some of the most expensive in the world, ironically. So, And our skill base is actually quite low. That's why there's no chip design and fabrication being done here. It's only assembly. You know? So a lot, of, a lot of chip makers are going elsewhere. That's sayang yun, no? And then let's go back to OFWs. I don't know if you're aware of this trend, but uh, com countries like Canada are becoming more friendly to Filipinos because they also want to build their labor base. So what are they doing now? No? And other countries will follow suit. They're actually allowing OFWs to bring their families na to Canada and live with them. And that will just accelerate migration. No? Like recently, they're loosening, they're loosening up a little bit on the visa requirements. The intention is actually to bring OFWs to stay in Canada na, hindi na sila OFW. So what's the implication? Certainly, it's better to live in Canada for most people rather than come home. The foreign currency income will disappear because they don't need to remit it back home. So if BPOs are at risk, OFWs are going to get pirated. And our manufacturing sector continues to, ano, di ba? to struggle. That doesn't bode well for the country's economy di ba? if it's a perfect storm. So we need to think of ways to use AI to our advantage. Because at the end of the day, it's about productivity and minimizing human misery. Dapat ganun yung inspiration. Eh. But, so I think the regulation conversation can also be used for that. No? Like how do we get more innovative with AI? But again... Uh, we all need to understand it first para we can lobby the government for it. So that's a very long uh, answer no, to your question, uh, JC. No? Uh, sir, uh, another question. Um, would, um, because you mentioned earlier that, um, I think in your previous webinar, that um, implementation is near, uh, that AI is nearly inevitable. So will this also affect, let's say, the education sector, like those from the DepEd and the CHED to update their curriculum to, um, to cater to what we call the rise of AI these days, sir? Um, when you say implementation, who so are what you I talking mean about? Is, no, what I mean is like, like um, knowledge about, let's say, how the chat GPT works, how you... What I mean is yung mga yung mga chat GPT and yung mga medyo tech tech um tech products that already uses AI. I say even in let's say sa dep and let's say in state universities and even in DepEd nagagamit na po siya. So will that also pose a challenge na rin po to change the curriculum to curriculum sa education? Ah okay, get it. Yeah, that's why I reserved the webinar specifically for education. Pero to answer that here, it's already happening. That's why the teachers want to ban it. I'm actually a teacher in a school and I'm saying, don't ban it. You have to be creative and now encourage students to still learn. Okay, the, I talked about this in a Twitter space no, the other day. I think the reality, it's my opinion, that the education sector needs to face is that education is just so outdated. People are in school not to learn. They're just there to get their credential, their diploma, because it's required for a job. That's why people don't absorb any real education. And what's 
even the way it's being taught is also very compliance driven. Or just submit this essay, do this quiz, get your laude if you can, and that's it. That's not education. No? That's uh, that's uh, that's bureaucracy. And then if you think about the way education works today, and this is irrespective of country, it takes you 16 years of training to be functional in the world. Parang ganun, di ba? K to 12 plus 4. If you want to take master's plus 4 pa, so 20 years. Anything you studied 20 years ago is probably outdated today, lalo na with the speed of development. So something is inherently wrong with that picture. We should find a way to compress education to less than 10 years. That doesn't mean you let people work na, ano, as minors. But you need to spend more time with other things. No? Number one, understanding how the economy works. Like, for example, I'll, I'll use myself. I only learned how the tax system worked. I was already working for 10 years. And it's because I started a business. I was not taught taxes in school. At least, I don't remember. I wasn't listening. Uh, and that's just one of many practical things uh, that we that generally people are not taught. We're taught about other generally useless things. No? And then if you go with the academic path, naman, you want to be a researcher, you want to be what? I don't know. Uh, how many of our PhDs actually are in innovation? Uh, again, I'm putting a blanket. Ano lang, uh, very few, I would say. Most are also there because it's a job. You know, I want to be a teacher, therefore I have a master's, I'll be a PhD soon so I can become a tenured professor because I want to earn money from being a teacher. Am I pushing the boundary or the envelope in terms of new technology? There are a few, but not all. I wouldn't say all. So that's a lot of brain power wasted in our education sector. It's compliance-driven. It's not innovative. And then, ganito na lang, ah. if we are really going to admit Let's say, let's admit for a second that the future is AI-driven, data-driven. How many of our schools are actually equipped to do AI? As in infrastructure, systems, you know? Kokonti lang. Maybe one or two, if I can think of two. Uh, no. So useless then for you to be teaching stuff that you saw on YouTube if you don't have the equipment to do it, diba? And that's ironic. That means 99.9% .9 of our schools are irrelevant in the AI age. And in fact, some people are finding jobs na nga, even without a college diploma, learning it completely online, using online tools, using chat GPT. So that should already tell you the writing is on the wall for education. But it's going to take a long time. Like, you know, Ched had data science as a memoranda as early as 2012 yata. But it was only in 2018 or 2019 when the schools actually figured out, oh, we need to do a bachelor's in data science, bachelor's in analytics, master's in... Uh, like, I, I co-wrote a master's degree in analytics. I'm not even from the education sector because they couldn't find anyone with practical experience. So I instead used that as an inspiration. So, okay, AAP got formed and we helped certain schools get their programs together. But here's the added thing. No? I'll be the first to say it, maybe. With AI, you don't really need to code that much to get things done. You can use the AI to help you with the code. So we're already at the point where AI is probably close to automotives, no? where the mechanic and the driver are two different people. You don't need to know spark plugs to drive a car. And even though you know transmission and you know change oil, doesn't mean you can drive in the Formula One. Talagang those are two separate occupations now. And I think that I spent the last 10 years of my life creating a process to produce more builders of AI. Yeah, Project Sparta, Masters in Ganyan. But now I fear that we actually need more users of AI rather than builders lang. And these are people who don't even need to learn R and Python. So dun ako medyo, I feel disrupted. That doesn't mean the people we've produced are useless, uh, but I'm sure some of you will be the first to admit the people who know coding and data science actually struggle with problem solving. I'm being generalistic. Lang. Of course, there are exceptions. Because they spent most of their time learning that thing and not learning the practical things that the businesses go through. Yeah, the businesses struggle with programmers. Because I've been in both camps. I'm a business owner and I was also a coder. Hirap talaga to translate. Uh, you're lucky if you're one of the few who can do both. But actually, it's hard. So we need more people with critical thinking, problem solving. But then if most of the people are studying if, then, and for loops, when are they going to learn that? No? Uh, 
that's probably where AI should come in. Uh, sorry for the rant. No? Um, we have five minutes left to 1.30. So anyone else has a question if you want to put up? Okay lang ba yun, JC? I hope I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Medyo ano, no? Heavy. Wait, about regulation naman. We'll have another webinar for education. Um, anyone want to suggest how we should regulate AI? I'm definitely not going to be the one to encourage it. Although I'm the one compiling the, the, ano, the observations. Uh, sorry, who wants to say anything? Hello? Here's a good trivia, no? Sir, question. Oh, yes, okay. Go um, again. What do you know exactly about um, exam by I don't know kung AI po ba siya. Kasi can you, yun can you put it in the chat? Tingnan natin. I've never heard of it. I know perplexity. That's a new chat bot. Uh, in the next webinar, it's all about tools lang. So malulunod kaya sa mga tools. No? Examplify. Examplify. Yun yung, yung ginagamit nung, ano, nung, yung pre-post ni Justice Leon dun sa best bar ever. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yun first, parang, time, first time to hear about it. I'll look into it. So ano, ano siya in a nutshell? Can you share? Ano po siya? Yung parang, it's like yung, ano tawag dito? Assessment. Parang, parang sa bar exam po. But it's ano siya? More... Chatbot for the bar exam? Parang ganun? Parang ganun po. Ah, okay. That's cool. I don't know. Ano kung, parang, ano thoughts niyo po dito if you, kasi I don't know kung AI, if we would categorize it under AI po eh. I tried searching for it. Di ko siya makita. But yeah, I'll look into it. Baka iba lang yung spelling. Um, I haven't heard of it. But I'll look into it. Sige, sige. Thank you, sir. I think generally, here's another thing uh, which I plan to tackle in next webinar is we were all, I think, uh, we were all expecting manual laborers to get displaced first. Di ba? Parang robotics, factories are going to get automated. Some are. Pero ironically, it's the white-collar work that has gotten disrupted. Copywriting, graphic design, photography, and education. And that should give you an idea of the disruption talaga. People were caught literally with their pants down with this thing. And then, okay, to give you some context then, Shepard Chat GPT was released to the public in November. Sometimes you wonder why they did it. And I have a, I have a theory. Kasi si OpenAI was founded by Elon Musk. No? But he left kasi nga he had uh, differences with the current management. Actually, they formed... Open AI to fight Google. Because at that time, it was just Google. DeepMind, Google Brain, they had the monopoly on all of the top talent in AI. And they said, mahirap if one company has the control. So they created Open AI to be a non-profit parang, ano, competitor. And then Elon Musk left. And syempre, he was the source of most of the money. So Sam Altman had to find other funders. One of them was Microsoft. But I think they had to release ChatGPT as a parang proof of concept, parang proof to Microsoft that uh, you know this thing can work. And when they did, Microsoft put money in. And then the naman si Elon Musk na yun kasi you're supposed to be a non-profit. That was the design. Now you're in cahoots with a for-profit entity. So that's why I think Elon Musk is in the, in the process of doing another open AI, x.ai. But for me, it's just fun and games lang for these guys. Eh. I'm, I'm uncomfortable personally that all the control on all these models is in the hands of a few people and they're all in California. So that's for me is the ultimate ha, ridiculousness <laughs> if you can say that. Because no matter what we do to regulate it in the Philippines, we're probably inconsequential to that discussion. Unless we are represented there. Maganda yung founder of the Ambit, si Lian Chua. Uh, she's not here now, but she was actually a collaborator of mine in data ethics. And then she went on her own path. She actually is represented in some of these fora no, in Canada, Montreal, uh, IEEE, and hopefully in Stanford. No? Because we need representatives there. So I'm also wondering, where are our AI leaders Baka hindi ko lang nakikita because I'm too busy, you know, holding these webinars. But where where are they? Where are the people who are supposed to guide us? It can't be just this. No, we need more broader. I mean, if you're an expert, please reach out to me. I'll help you get a platform. 
Because that's, I think, what we need. At saka, let's admit that this, this stuff is very technical at the outset. So we need to simplify it so that people can understand it. Actually, the people attending this webinar, you're actually one of the few who probably understand it. So what about the rest of the human race? So I was, I was at CNN kahapon lang, eh, and then the other day I was at Net25. Ano talaga, ibang market talaga yung, yung masa. But I think they need to be represented because they're using these tools. <laughs> they're using it to cheat. They're using it to create images. Some of them are using it for freelancing, for content creation. So nandyan na siya. Pero the way, uh, I would say, the establishment, quote-unquote, of AI and analytics, still very elite, you know, top schools, AAP, these are not the masa. So I hope to reach the masa nga, kaya I'm TikTok. Pero even the way I'm doing this webinar, napaka-English. Dapat tinatagalog ko siguro. Maybe another version dapat tagalog. Okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, 131 na. Maybe one more. Going, going. Okay, sige. So, I, you know, first, thank you for your patience. I know this was kind of a long thing. I mean, you can't, I mean, we'd, I'd love to talk longer. I'm, I'm considering a change in format because we were doing this mostly noontime and I know people are working. Maybe Saturday could work better and we can do it longer. You know? So I'm going to do a Saturday run for the next one. And I think that might, that might help. So let me know if that works. Uh, I'm also conscious about evenings because some people are also you know, with their families. So I'll try either Saturday afternoon or Saturday noontime. So you have more flexibility to, to hang around. Because as you can see, one and a half hours is hardly enough time to talk about this. Uh, I also want to increase the audience. No? So that's, that's my goal. So anyway, in the meantime, thank you very much. Uh, please fill up the, uh, no, the feedback form. It's on the chat and it's also on Facebook. Uh, and then uh, let me know your feedback on how we can improve the, the series better. And in the meantime, uh, that's it. No? Episode 2 signing off. Episode 3 will probably be next Saturday. So please stay tuned for that. Thank you very much.